The scripture passage this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, reading verses 1 to 15. I am reading from the Pew Bible, which is a slightly different version than the uh, New International, so it might be slightly different from what you see on the screen. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. The Lord will add his blessing to this reading of his word. All right, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, everyone, for uh, leading us thus far in the service. I really like having a fan there. Hopefully I won't uh, sweat to death this week. We're continuing on in our uh, three-part sermon series on, on intersections. This is the third and, and final week of that. Um, as Kathy mentioned, uh, Pastor Scott will be returning from vacation this coming week, but him and Peter are doing a, a pulpit swap. So next Sunday you'll see our office administrator, Peter Metcalf, up here. Um, yeah, we're excited about that. Um, but just, yeah, this is the end of the, this sermon series, and then we'll be hearing from Peter next week, and I believe Scott the week after that. So two weeks ago, we, we began this series by looking at how God intersected a broken world. We looked at how, you know, he made that first, that one great intersection by sending his son Jesus to address um, the problem of sin and evil, and how he, he made a way uh, when we ourselves could not. And then last week we talked about how while looking, while understanding this uh, intersection as a whole, how it has global implications, uh, it, it still at the same time addresses issues of the heart. And while it's, yeah, well, it's a, it's a global, it has global implications, it also uh, reaches to the very heart of every individual human. So then this week, having talked about these two things, we're going to talk about well, what do we do with that when knowing that God has intersected the world and he's made a way for each individual. Um, what does it mean when the church then intersects its communities? And as, as I began studying and reading through this passage that Wendy read for us, uh, if, if you remember it, the, the start of the passage, it lists uh, Jesus' 12 disciples. And I, I frequently skip through this part because if you've been in church for some time, you, you're probably familiar with these 12 disciples, and I, I figured I already knew who they were, so there was no point in me um, reading their names again. But then, after I kind of read through it and dwelled on it a few times, I 
realize that what makes this passage so powerful and what really gives it impact and influence is when we have a clear understanding of who it is that Jesus is addressing in these words, when we look at the life of these uh, 12 individuals that he's talking to. My wife and I uh, have been watching the show, the show, this TV series called The Chosen, which uh, some of you may be familiar with it. But anyways, it's a, it's a Christian TV series that showcases the life of Jesus. And there's been uh, many of these made before. I believe this is probably uh, the least cringy and the, probably the best well done of all of them. But anyways, it, it shows, it, it walks us through the life of Jesus, but through the, the perspective of of the disciples. And through the first season, the show gets us acquainted with these 12 disciples. And it's easy when we, when we go to church and we, we hear of the, the, the stories that these disciples are in, we think of them as these heroic men who are especially gifted and they're chosen by Jesus um, because of their extraordinary giftings and abilities. But as I watch this show and as we as we get acquainted with these 12 disciples, we see them uh, not exactly as these kind of heroic figures. We see them as fishermen who are down on their luck, socially awkward tax collectors, liars and rough around the edges kind of people, people who aren't that different from you and I. But as we, as we get to the end of season one, there's this really neat scene um, it ends with this group of people all gathered together, this unassuming group of people. As they're gathered around Jesus and they begin walking down this hill into the sunset, journeying together as they follow Jesus into the city of Samaria to continue their ministry. This, this visual brought me back to uh, another high school memory. I must be having some sort of high school nostalgia because this is the second week in a row that it's given me some sort of sermon illustration from a, a high school memory. But this memory brought me back to my grade 12 year when we had our annual dodgeball tournament, which for whatever reason, our school took dodgeball very seriously. <laughs> so I verbally committed to this team that was, at least on paper, many assumed would be the team to beat in our high school. This team, we were made up of uh, different football, basketball, soccer, and hockey players, a team that we assumed would be uh, very athletic, would be very fast, strong, uh, and with great reflex abilities. However, when I went down to the gym to sign my name up for this team, I realized that my name had already been put down, except I was, my name was written underneath another team, and that team name was the Sitting Ducks. So as the name suggests, this team did not sign themselves up expecting to win the tournament. It was just a group of grade 12s who wanted to have some fun and to make some memories before they graduated from high school. This was not my intention going to the tournament, however. As a potentially overly confident grade 12 boy, I've, everything I did, I did it to win. So aggressively, I scratched my name off of the list and I wrote it under the other team, the Red Hots, which was the team name, um, which was the team that I was expecting to be on and that was expected to win the tournament. So as the tournament began, we won our first several games. However, on the other side of the bracket, the Sitting Ducks were also winning their games due to some combination of luck and injuries to their opponents. So as the tournament went on, the final match was set between us, the Red Hots, against the Sitting Ducks, which we assumed would be quite a lopsided event. The game started off as you, might ex as you might have imagined. We gained an early lead, and our entire team was left standing while the Sitting Ducks only had one player left. And this particular player could hardly throw a dodgeball halfway across the gym. So we figured that the game was over and we were about to win. According to the, r the rules of dodgeball, if you catch a ball thrown by an opponent, the player who threw the ball is out, and then your team can bring a player back in. So we figured all we had to do was stand near the half court line, catch a dodgeball, the game and the tournament would be over. So the opponent confidently picked up a couple dodgeballs, approached us near the half court line, and started throwing very softly towards us. However, as he started throwing these dodgeballs, they 
they were so gentle that they, we weren't able to easily catch them uh, you know, around our chest area, but they went to our ankles, which were just slightly out of reach. So one by one, he began knocking us out. And eventually, he ended up somehow, I, I don't remember quite how, but he, he caught one of our own throws, so that meant that one, of our, one more of our players was out, and then they were able to bring another player back in. So as the game went on, we actually ended up losing the game. The Sitting Ducks ended up winning the game and the tournament. And even though it's been about 10 years from now, the, some of my friends who are on the Sitting Ducks still give me a hard time to this day for abandoning <laughs> their Cinderella team. We talk about it as though it were, it were some sort of fairy tale written kid show, but it was something that actually happened. So when I read of these 12 disciples and when I consider the people that Jesus is addressing here in this story in Matthew 10, I couldn't help but have, be reminded of this visual of this sitting ducks team that ruined my high school sports career that was never really that important to begin with. These 12 disciples that Jesus called had absolutely nothing in common. They had no particular giftings or skills or nothing in particular to brag about, other than the fact that for whatever reason, Jesus chose them to follow him. The next thing I want us to talk about is the way that Jesus goes about progressing his mission. Notice that through verses uh, 5 through 7 that Wendy read for us, he he instructs the disciples to not go amongst the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but rather to just go throughout the house of Israel proclaiming the good news. So does this mean that Jesus is being exclusive and he's showing favoritism to these certain people? I'll say that no, he does not. He recognizes the story of scripture as we read through the Bible that through the centuries, centuries, Israel, this nation of Israel, has been God's chosen covenant people that he's chosen, not because of anything that they did right, but simply, as God does, as he, he chooses them to be a representation of, of him and his goodness. And so God realizes that for his kingdom message to spread properly throughout the world, he must, that Jesus must first start uh, ministry in his closest sphere in the community that he's a part of. As someone like myself who's passionate about uh, Christianity and uh, from a global context and seeing how it's um, impacting and moving throughout other parts of the world, I found this concept to be quite convicting. While to the disciples Jesus was instructing them not to go outside of Israel, a modern day equivalent to us is him saying, you know, as you're going about and doing ministry, don't begin by hopping on a plane and going on some sort of missions or service trip on a, in another part of the world without first considering your own local sphere. Consider the people around you, the people that you intersect with on a day-to-day -day basis. How can we be proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God to our friends, our families, and neighbors, and those who we cross paths with every day. Because as we know from later on in the book of Matthew, if we were to continue reading, Jesus eventually instructs his disciples not just to go throughout Israel, but he says to go throughout all the world making disciples of all nations. But as we see here earlier on in chapter 10, his first priority is to go throughout Israel and share the good news in your own communities. I've done some uh, courses and kind of seminars over the years on global Christianity, and I've learned lots of cool things and, and seen how, you know, how the, the church has impacted um, parts of the world outside of our communities. And it's, it, it, I learned lots of neat things, and it made me passionate about, yeah, these issues of global Christianity. But what happened through this, however, what, what I, I've, I noticed in myself was that I became so fixated on this issue of spreading uh, the gospel to throughout the earth, but I, I missed the need of seeing the gospel in my own backyard, in our own communities in and around us. Because when I think about our context here and in Bedford and, and in our surrounding communities, 
I realize that there is such a great need for the good news of Jesus, the good news of his kingdom to fill our homes, our schools, our workplaces, and beyond. Because while statistically we can look and see that there's places in the world that have no churches, no good news of Jesus, we can see that right here as well. While there may be church buildings all over the place, the, the good news and the message of Jesus is often vacant uh, from our hearts, from our homes and our lives. So how are we witnessing the good news of Jesus, not just abroad, but in our own communities, to our friends, our families, and neighbors? As they're going, Jesus instructs them to proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. And I just want to take a moment to say, um, this week I, I'm using this language, kingdom of heaven. The last two weeks we've talked about uh, the kingdom of God, and I just want to say that they're the same thing. These words are interchangeable. The last two weeks we were reading from, we were looking at the, the gospel according to Luke, who uses this language of kingdom of God through the book of Matthew. There's this language of the kingdom of heaven. It's just an author's preference, but they're essentially referring to the same thing. So don't be confused there. Two weeks ago, we talked about this kingdom and, and what it is exactly that God is establishing. And we discussed that at its roots, essentially, the kingdom of God is God intersecting in a broken world where he created things as good as, as a, a whole and a working unit but where it's gone wrong. And the good news is that God has returned where he will once again make his dwelling among us. So as the disciples are going about their ministry, as they're going home to home throughout Israel, they're not going into home saying, you better turn your life around or else God is going to punish you. This isn't the good news that they're proclaiming. Rather, they're saying things like, good news, God Although the world has been broken, although your situations have been hard, God is, has intersected our space and he's bringing his space amongst us yet again. And you're invited to join him and to join his people in the work that he is doing in establishing his kingdom on earth. And then he tells his disciples to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, drive out demons. So here he's saying to them, don't just tell them about the kingdom of God, show it to them, demonstrate it to them. And many of us here might be thinking, well, I don't necessarily do these things. I don't cleanse lepers, drive out demons, raise dead people day in and day out. So does that mean that I'm not necessarily being a faithful follower of Jesus? No. So let's remember that, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, that Jesus is speaking to people in ancient, is, in ancient Israel in a context where their worldview was so connected to the spiritual realm and that they saw a, a, a very tight correlation that uh, their sin was connected to uh, physical impairment, demonic possession, and those things. So the, the disciples doing these things uh, is showing them that God has come to set the world free from sin and evil. And for us, this means that it's not enough to just go about our communities talking about the kingdom of heaven and the good things that God has done and, he's, and that he's doing. He's saying that we have to demonstrate it as well. We can't just speak, but we have to act on it. We can't say things like, God has come to feed the hungry and then not go and feed the hungry ourselves. We can't just say that God has come to clothe the naked and then not give them clothing ourselves. Proclaiming the kingdom of heaven involves both word and deed. It involves us speaking out the good news, what God has done and what he's doing. It involves us not just doing as much social, social service as we can, but about partnering in action with the things that God is doing. So how are we demonstrating the good news of the kingdom of God to our friends, our families, neighbors, and beyond. In verses 9 and 10, Jesus gives his disciples a list of things to not take with them on their journey. 
And all the things that he says are good and practical things that would probably help the disciples to be more prepared and to be more equipped as they go about their journey. So for us, does this mean that when we go on any sort of missions or service trip that we shouldn't do any sort of planning or packing? This isn't exactly what Jesus is saying, so let me explain. The point that he's trying to get across here is that the success of our ministry is not determined by our own efforts or preparedness. It's done by the fact that God is at work in the world making all things new and our role is to submit to him and the planning and preparing that we do is is just simply a vessel uh, of allowing God to do what he does. And the same goes for us here at our Sunday gatherings. Would it be right for me or for Pastor Scott or whoever's speaking to come up here without having a, a message or some sort of sermon prepared? Or in the same way, is it, is it right if Leanne comes up here and leads us in music without having done any sort of choir practice? Again, these are not the things that Jesus is saying. But what he is saying is that having those things prepared in and of themselves aren't the things that draw us closer to Jesus. It's Jesus himself who draws us to him, and he uses our efforts as empty vessels to help guide those things. Later on in verses 11 through 15, we find Jesus instructing his disciples how to respond if, or I should say, when they face rejection. And the following language that we read and that we heard from Wendy might strike us as a bit crude. It might seem a bit a bit grumpy to hear Jesus say that if you ask to stay in a stranger's home and they don't accept you, then you should shake the dust off your feet. But what Jesus is urging them to do as they're on their journey, he's telling them, remain faithful. Keep your integrity despite how people may treat you. It was custom in the ancient world for strangers to show up to your house and for you to offer them their hospitality. This might be a concept or idea that's maybe a little less familiar to us here. If someone were to to knock on my door that was a complete stranger, I'd probably be a bit thrown off and I wouldn't know quite what to do. But in in the ancient context, this was a very common practice, was for strangers to come and show up unexpectedly unannounced. And you as an unexpected host, it was your role to provide for and to care for them. However, the good news of the kingdom was quite a radical concept for many people. So Jesus is urging the disciples that while they go about proclaiming the good news, that they are to expect rejection. And Jesus urges them that when this happens, they shouldn't just stay around and argue. However, they should act with integrity and act faithful. As he says, kick the dust off your feet and move on to the next home. Don't waste your time having useless arguments with people who don't want to have you. And like the disciples, we should also ex- be expecting rejection as we, compl- as we proclaim the good news of the gospel. So I mentioned over the last couple of weeks, the, the good news of the kingdom of God is, of course, it is good news. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that it comes with the cost. Because in order to follow Jesus, according to Matthew 24, 16, it says that we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. And while it's, it's good to do events and do things that, where we're inviting our communities in, we also need to remember that we're not inviting people into a free and easy life, but we're inviting them into a life of discipleship. A, a life where they're invited to, to pick up their cross and to follow Jesus with however that looks, through good times, through difficult, through easy, through trying. But it's when we let go of ourselves and follow Jesus, that's when we're able to find true life with everlasting joy in him. So in conclusion, as we go, let me just remind us of a few things, that God has chosen us like the disciples, not because of any of our own abilities 
gifts or talents, but because simply of his love for us and that he chose us. And that proclaiming the good news of the kingdom throughout the earth starts in our own backyards. It starts in our own communities and people that we cross paths with day to day. And that as we do so, as we go about proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, that we should put our trust in God and not in ourselves or our own abilities. And that even in the midst of rejection, that we should remain faithful and act with integrity. Because despite rejection, it's with him that we'll find our true life of everlasting joy. I'm going to pray, and after I pray, I'll invite Leanne to come and lead us in a final hymn, number 187, The Church is One Foundation. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the goodness of who you are and your simple but sometimes unclear um, instructions to us. We thank you that yeah, we thank you that, that we have your word in, in writing and that we have the opportunity to, to dig into it and to understand what you've said to your followers throughout the centuries. So God, we ask that we would take your words and we would apply them to not just our, our minds, but to our hearts and our lives as well. God, help us to put our trust solely in you, not in our own capabilities, but to trust in you. And God, as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, would we be aware of the people around us and the need for the news of your kingdom and the good news of your son, that it would dwell in us and that we would faithfully share that news um, to all those we intersect with on a day-to-day -day basis. We pray that as we leave this space, God, that we would be reminded of your presence that continues with us seven days a week, 365 days a year. And Lord, we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.